you know, it's not easy to live under the occupation, to suffer every day in pain with your family. You see your children every day suffering because of this occupation. When you see your child shot in front of you, and the world is silent. I think the only way that to uh, have the solution and to end the occupation is to put more pressure from outside, from inside, in Palestine and outside from the people, as the same was happened in uh, South Africa, that came from outside the BDS movement and all these that succeed. So we need this a third intifada, third global intifada that bring all the people from outside, from inside, in universities, everywhere, make you as activists. When you are suffering and in pain under the occupation, <coughs> day after day, and uh, they continue to use the violence against you, against the family, against the land also as the farmers, when they destroyed the land of the people, when they cut the olive trees. So you have to resist, there is no other choice. Actually, but in 2040, they project that the United States would be a minority majority country. Right. And that would be the Hispanics, African Americans, Muslims, Asians, whatever. And that is what drives the fear of the racist. And right, and right now they say kindergarten children in America of p children of color are already a, ma a majority, if that's correct. I've heard people say that. So this is the fear of racist America, and it's not all of America, but that's probably what's driving it. In Israel, within between the river and the sea, Palestinians are probably already the majority, including Gaza, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and those Palestinians that live within Israel. And so that they probably outnumber, and if they had democracy and voted, that would be on the end of a Jewish state. But it might be the beginning of a better world and a better life for everybody within that place. So I think the racism of Israel is fearing a majority of people of color in Israel and the, and that the people in America are being pushed by the racism of those that fear when America becomes majority minority in 2040, if, if those numbers are correct. Is that the settlers are extremely heavily armed, even um, the children. So children are allowed, the, the settler children are even allowed to walk around with weapons and arrest, like guns, knives, whatever they want. Uzis, I mean, they can walk around heavily armed in neighborhoods and nothing is allowed to be said. They can harass um, Palestinians of all ages and nothing, if nothing can be done. So it's not to say that the, where they're always saying that Palestinians are teaching their children to hate Israelis. It's, it's quite the opposite. There was a documentary that actually showed where they were showing the children, like the Israeli settler children, um, how to use the weapons and telling them, how, you know, how to kill, you know, kill Palestinians. It was very, it was disturbing. It was very disturbing to watch. No, oh, they were signing on the rockets. Before on the rockets they too. The, that was the, even more disturbing. But like, yeah. but this is one that was actually separate where they were showing them and telling them. The kid was like, oh, I had a bad dream. With Palestinians, I'm gonna kill all the you know all the Palestinians. And like he said, they were having the kids sign their names or say kill their on the bombs before they went to go bomb the children. So it's really the opposite. Um, the kids are always harassing Palestinians, the settler children. The settlers, like he said, they're more dangerous. It's basically they have they've been given op you know open access <laughs> to do whatever they want. It's it's similar to America in the South during um, slavery where they had open rights to do whatever they want to black men or black, you know, basically black men. I mean, it was mostly the black African-American men and women. They felt like they can treat them any way they wanted to. And that's just how it is with um, Palestinians is the settlers just have open access. They can walk into a Palestinian house Come while they're eating the dinner and just do whatever, they, they kill them. Americans here in America of Palestinian descent, um, and in particular Muslims as well, we feel that this um, election is extremely biased because we have two total candidates who are going against everything 
that we're for, especially concerning Palestine. But this is not a new phenomenon. This is something that's been going on for at least the last 40, 50 years in presidential elections. Um, and actually since the existence of the illegal Israeli entity, uh, where Harry Truman recognized the state of Israel. So he was the first president. So we've been having those problems since then. It has never changed. Um, Trump is very extreme towards Muslims, obviously. He wants to ban Muslims from coming in this country. That's the least that we know of, that he openly says. He wants to build a wall for Mexico on their own dime. Um, and he has said very degrading remarks against women in general, against people with disabilities. So he's against everybody, okay? so, to be fair. It's not just against Muslims. But Muslims in particular, because that's what sells. Racism in America sells. America was built on racism. So this is something that's been ongoing. Um, for Palestinians, it's catastrophic because Hillary Clinton has sold her soul to AIPAC. Uh, she was their main featured guest speaker. In Israeli Political Action Committee uh, based in Washington, D.C. They are the core people that fund the Israeli occupation. They are the core people that basically uh, make up our foreign policy here in the United States. And they should always be a primary target of activism um, because that's uh, the organization that's basically destroying the United States with their foreign policies. They want to go to war with Iran. They want to go to war with everybody that threatens the existence of Israel. Actually, this has been a phenomenon as far as what you're saying about the land. How does it play a role with U.S. imperialism, let's say? Okay, what is the question should be, what does the United States get out of it? Because they're the primary funders of the illegal occupation. Mm -hmm. um, it absolutely plays nothing towards the United States. The United States gets nothing out of the occupation of Palestine. And this has been the phenomenon. So in 1948, the Balfour Declaration before that and so on and so forth, has made this vision that they want to give this land to the Jews. They want to make it a Jewish homeland. Okay, So that, that is what is called Zionism, which is a racist supremacist ideology Okay, that wants to sit itself on top of another people's land and take it. That's exactly what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Of course, it plays into U.S. imperialism as far as broadening their territory, as far as taking over more lands and, and having airspace and, and allies. Maybe that's the only thing I can think of as benefiting the United States is that they have an ally in the position. Middle East who they want to bomb, who they want to send planes. <laughs> Maybe in that factor, it does benefit them. But as far as like, I'm saying, what does America benefit? I mean, in a good way, is what I'm trying to say. Is there isn't any benefit. And, and that has been, if you look at Alison Weir's book, she explains that really, really good, okay? If, uh, it talks about that in particular, like what does the United States get out of it? So other than more land domination, um, spreading their wings across the world like they have been doing, it really does not benefit them. And most of the companies and most of the things in charge of, in the United States, the banks, the security, the defenses, even the people who are high up in the government, they are in some way, shape, or form attached to Israel. So it's their benefits, it benefits them for Israel to be successful regardless. They are having the settlements inside of Palestinian territory, which makes it hard, how are you gonna take them out? There's no way to take them out and retract them out of Palestinian territory, so it's hard to have two separate states because they've, they've infiltrated, even though the, Israel and Palestine, Israel, Israel, and then there's a the Palestinian territory, it's supposed to be separate entities, they still are invading and infiltrating Palestinian territories and building Palestinian, ter you know, settle Israeli settlements in Palestinian territories. Like an activist is uh, most of my life, as I am uh, 43 years old, all my life under the occupation, I started uh, my resistance. I grew with the violence of the Israeli army uh, because my village also under the occupation since 1967. I grew with this all violent. Uh, I joined the Persian Tepada. When it started, I was a child, 14 years old. And from that time in jail, in, 
I've been in jail many times. I've been uh, activist against the occupation in many ways. So to live under the occupation as a child, it's uh, really very hard. To be in jail as a child is very difficult and hard life in Israeli jails. How they treated the uh, Palestinians, especially the children in jails. It's uh, very bad. And when you hear settlements, you, you don't really get the full picture of what these complexes are. They're, they're actually armed castle fortresses that are, they have machine gun turrets, they have roads to them that cut through Palestinian land that separate people from their crops. So the people, they, they close the, the road crossings for hours a day. The people cannot cross these roads on the way to the settlements because they are supposedly securing the freedom of the, the Israeli people in the settlements to get there. And, and if you could speak to what that's actually like, because I've seen the maps. And I mean, the, the West Bank and Gaza are supposed to be for Palestinians, but when you crisscross them with roads that no one can cross, that are barricades and, and fences, uh, similar to the ones we saw here in Cleveland a couple weeks ago that people are not allowed to cross but an hour or two a day they cannot water their crops they cannot visit their families what is the point and why is it we allow this to happen and I know there are Cleveland companies there's a Cleveland developer there are many people from this area that are building these settlements and I don't understand why we allow it to continue without far more vocal uh, occupation of their front doors because they live here and we know who they are, and they are preventing the free movement in the tiny open-air prisons that are allowed the Palestinian people uh, by nature of shutting down the access. 250 settlements in, uh, inside the West Bank, and we have 400 checkpoints to protect them. Right. Many roads, that special uh, roads that comes for the settlements, and they confiscated the land of the people, the farmers, to, uh, to make these roads between the settlements and the cities, between the settlements uh, itself. Uh, 600,000 settlers in West Bank, and they are most danger than the army. If you talk about the settlers in West Bank, as we heard last year when they burn uh, the family of the, the Wabsha family in Duma village, it was by, made by uh, settlers. They born a child 18 months with his father and mother in, when yeah. they was leaving. Uh, and this is what the, the Nazim did against the Jews. So it's the same what the Nazim uh, did in that time, the Zionists doing against the Palestinian uh, in this uh, time. Mind you, BDS is non-violent. BDS, they, they, Palestinians always get criticized, you know, if they're resisting. Um, by, by armed resistance or like Hamas or the PFLP or one of the resistance movements in power, they get criticized for that. Now, if you work in nonviolent means, like our friend here, Iyad Burnat, you know, who's very popular in Palestine for doing, uh, which is fighting against the walls that are being built in his village, Beli. Okay, so, and then also if you participate in BDS, which is the simplest forms of resisting the illegal occupation of Israel, okay, uh, by educating people, by targeting companies that basically fund the Israeli occupation of Palestine, now are being criminalized. So if you don't want the Palestinians to resist, you know, by any means necessary, which is the armed resistance, and you don't want Palestinians to resist peacefully, then what do you want? That's what the Palestinians are asking the world. So if you're criminalizing these effects, that is a shame, and that's something that we all have to hear in America stand up against. Stand up against our politicians who are bought out by Zionism, you know, who are puppets for the Israeli occupation of Palestine. This is what America here should do. Like Iyad was saying before, stop the funding of the occupation. Stop the funding of the killing of their people. People have died in this village protecting Berlin. Okay, and we need to, this is our job. People like Iyad are our connection, you know, that we must fight against. They tell us what they want. They lead the Palestinian struggle, and we here living like myself in the diaspora that want to return back home to Palestine. These are champions in Palestine that are fighting not only for them, they're fighting for us, for our rights. 
So we need to stand up here in America and the least we can do is fight this oppression, fight this insanity that wants to criminalize peaceful means to end the occupation. A few months ago, they get six million tear gas from the United States, from uh, that uh, company, yes, CTS. CTS, yes. CTS in Pennsylvania. Yes. Every time it comes up in the UN to charge Israel with something, the United States vetoes. In the UN. The United States is constantly vetoing any any time any issue that comes when it's gonna be against Israel, it's a constant veto by the United States. Um, Israel has been charged with war crimes, multiple war crimes. Their prime ministers have been charged with multiple as war, war criminals. So the leaders of you know, so that when they talk about other governments having um, war criminals as their leaders, their leaders are multi war criminals. You know, you had Sharon who was in charge of, you know, when it happened, the two um, camps in the 70s, Shutilla and Sabrin. Was it, which were the two camps? Sabra and Shutilla. Yeah, where there was complete, they killed everybody. And who was under, who was who was in control, who was responsible for that, Sharon. And that's in the audience who has been charged with multiple war crimes. Um, you have their, their, one of their, their prime ministers are constantly coming out and saying, all the, all the Muslims, all the Palestinians, not even Muslims, all Palestinians, which includes the Christian ones too, need to be murdered, need to be killed. They need to be, the land needs to be cleansed of Palestinians. So they're talking about Muslims and Christians, and even the Jewish ones that support Palestinians, because they're, they go to jail too. And where there was international Palestinian media where they were staying in the hotels, those hotels were actually being bombed. Yeah. So they're constantly attacked. So, and plus you have to remember who's controlling the satellites, who's con controlling what's coming in and what's going out. And also, when it even when it comes to social media, um, a lot of Palestinians who are living abroad, when if they are activists and Palestinian activists, um, when they try to go back to Palestine to visit, they are not allowed entrance into Palestine. Sometimes they're be they're forced to sign a paper that they or they are told to sign a paper. Not most of them do not sign it. Um, when they try to enter Palestine by the Israeli soldiers, that they are committing acts against Israeli safety, and that's just by being an activist. We use, uh, you know, we use the nonviolent way in our struggle from the beginning, and if we look to the first intifada, it was a popular intifada in the nonviolent way a hunger strike, demonstration, boycott, videos. Uh, same as now that we use, uh, especially in Belayin village, we use uh, since 12 years the nonviolent resistance by uh, uh, demonstrations every week, by creative ideas, by uh, uh, and also we have international Israeli activists that join us every week in these demonstrations. Uh, Sometimes you feel that you have uh, succeed in the ground and succeed uh, outside. That's give you more hope to continue this. And there's another thing where they're doing something called mapping, where um, I'm almost off topic from your question to begin with, but where they are going into homes of Palestinians at night and they will take pictures of everyone in the home and map where they're sleeping so that they know where they are and where they're sleeping. And Israel is one of the only supposed democratic governments that are actively arresting young children, especially male Palestinian boys. So you have male Palestinian, you know, children, Palestinians, both female and male, who are in prisons with adults um, for something as little as being accused of throwing a rock at a truck, at a bulldozer. Or if an Israeli accuses a Palestinian child of spitting in their facility, in their area, then they will be arrested. So um, there's acts of, in, you know, it's been inhumane for years, just never been documented or nobody's really cared. Just by saying your country, like me saying my country, I can, they can stamp my passport and deport me and say I can't come back to Palestine. So, and then there was one activist who actually heard, they played a recording of her speaking here in the United States in a, in a private meeting. And they didn't, they, you know, so she was listening, they had her listen to herself speaking with other people about the, you know, you know, an, you know anti-Israeli government events or pro-Palestinian events. She, they're playing it for her. So, and 
that, that happened in the United States, and she's now trying to go to visit Palestine, and they played it for her. So, I mean, Palestinian um, activists are even, they're at risk that they, if you're going to be an activist, you have to know that you, not, you might have a chance of not being able to be en enter your country. Look, uh, people didn't understand, especially outside of Palestine, uh, Europe, United States, they didn't understand because of the media. That's, they didn't give him the truth. They didn't show the life of the Palestinians under the occupation. Uh, they didn't uh, say that, it, they're saying always that it's a war, and it's not a war. They're saying it's uh, a religious conflict, and it's not a religious conflict, it's a, a colonization. Palestinian media locally is great. The thing is their outreach is limited. So they're within Ramallah, for example, okay? A lot of times they shut down their offices. Uh, Who is that? Yeah, the Israelis okay. actually go in there and make incursions and go into Ramallah and shut down their offices for speaking. Okay. Um, so yeah, there is a, a powerful media base. Um, <coughs> the thing is, once they start hitting on some points in, in reference to the prisoners, for example, Palestinian political prisoners, you have a Damir, okay, which is one of the um, awesome media outlets that are on Facebook as well and that are, you know, all across the social media spectrum. They shut them down. They've actually went there, arrested people in the offices. So yeah, there is great media, you know, in occupied Palestine. The thing is, they also suffer. They also suffer by being bombarded, by being bombed, by being shot at, and uh, including the Palestinian journalists. Yeah, so they get shot at too. So they have one of the most dangerous jobs on earth. You know? yeah. The United States, uh, they're, str they're starting to, in attempts to criminalize BDS, the BDS movement, okay? which uh, one of them started it off with Governor Cuomo in New York. He actually did an executive order where anyone who boycotts uh, the illegal entity of Israel um, will be blacklisted. Um, New York will actually go after those companies that boycott Israel. So this is how severe the situation has gotten. Now as far as when it was, why originally they were allowed in, it was a an answer to how to solve the problem after the war, World War One and Two. You know, what do we do with these, with the Jewish people who were being, you know, murdered by Hitler? Where should we send them? Um, how do we make up? Send them to Palestine because it wasn't declared a state yet. So they sent them to Palestine, the Holy Land, and then um, they just took the Zionists to go over from there. They even, and, and what people don't realize is that true Jewish people do not like the European Jews or Zionists as they call them too. They don't like them. They don't They don't approve of there being a state of Israel. Um, they, there's been Jewish people who have been killed as well. So there, there's a group here that's active in the United States of Orthodox Jews who are act actively boycotting the state of Israel. They say it's against their religion for there to be a state of Israel. So the pretense that they claim the state of Israel was for religious purposes, but that was just a front and a cover because it's not really what it's for. It's really just to have control of the land. And we give three, the United States gives three, over three billion dollars in aid a year to Israel. There's been multiple cases of espionage where Israeli um, Israelis or people from the Mossad have been caught um, stealing U.S. Sec you know information, security information, and nothing. No one's been charged with treason. When the 9/11 happened, they caught three people from Israel who recorded the whole entire event. Like they were there, just standing there, recording the whole entire event before it even started, and nothing across the bridge, and nothing happened. It's failing. I mean, how, there's so many students who don't know how to read. Yeah, in America, people who are 18 years old, 19 years old, went through school but don't know how to read and write. So, so I mean. If you go to Israel, if, if you are a Israeli, you get free education, you get monthly stipend, which is basically, they get cash and money. They're living better than anyone here in the United States is living, and we're asking ourselves, what, where's all our money going? It's going to Israel. But then we have to again remember Israel and America. I mean, it's basically like they're the same, one is left hand, one is the right hand. I mean, they're the same people who are running the government in the United States. Are, they have, you know, people in Israel. That's why they're. That's why it's like that. Like the banks. When we had the bank, when we had the housing crisis in the United States, the banks that were the main banks that were in charge of it all were owned by Zionists. 
did they ever go to court for that? No. I mean, we had a huge housing crisis in the United States, and they just took all the money and left. That's it. Um, there were uh, there were masjids in the, 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 the World Trade Center, and some people are like, well, they were Muslim fanatics. If you're a Muslim fanatic, you're not going to be at a bar the night before you're going to claim some holy act. And they were saying that the, that these people were at a bar the night before drinking. It makes you know you you, can, you have to realize there's a, there's there's it's not a conspiracy theory, but you, you have to open your eyes enough to understand there's more to the story. Just like when the Palestinian activist was murdered in um, the UAE in his hotel room and they actually broke it down to how he was murdered. They made it look like he was injected with something to make it look like he had a heart attack. So they broke it down and they re went in and they showed the camera footage and showed that they were using false IDs of other Israelis. So I mean, it's the Mossad. If you ever, I mean, we support, like that's our government, we're supporting uh, terrorism. And if you look at what happened in Ferguson, the same company that was that was using the bombs on the Ferguson people is the same company that uses the, was using the bombs in Gaza and against Palestinians. And then why are American police officers being trained by Israelis? That's another thing because it's all one and the same. People don't realize that. We are not against the Jewish people. We are against the occupation, and uh, we try our best to send this message to many people outside in the world to understand by our social media, by our touring, by our uh, like speaking tour, by uh, uh, our videos, movies, uh, books, to educate more people to understand about the story in Palestine. And it's important, especially in the United States, to uh, for the people to understand the story because the media here is lying. To you can't go and charge them in an international court, criminal court. Uh, there are other uh, lawsuits that have been put out against uh, Israel for attacks on <coughs> people. And uh, sometimes uh, on land issues, they win in, in court very once in a while. Uh, but uh, even the, um, the U.S. woman that was killed by the bulldozer, uh, Rachel Corey, her parents tried to sue for that and uh, they did not receive uh, justice on that case. And she, they were, she was purposely run over. Uh, she was wearing an orange uh, suit. She, she was seen by the bulldozer man and not only did the driver, not only did he run over her once, backed up and ran over again. Jim Corey in 2000 and... Uh, That's the one that the Israelis make fun of and they call her pancake. You know, that was done. Absolutely, because she was bulldozed. She was killed by a bulldozer. That was in Gaza. Rafa. No, no, no. She, but she was one of the, she was one of the stories that were highlighted and were kind of brought about, you know, um, with her family's help to bring about to the world. Um, so she's received uh, her case received um, international attention, which is good. Um, but the Israelis have went to the extent to make fun of her. They call her pancakes. They actually, uh, if you went on Twitter or if you went all over social media, they were actually trending something in regards to Rachel Corey being a pancake. That's how racist, that's how evil, and that's how vile these people are. They're really, you know, human rights activists and they fight for Palestinian rights. It is by and far very small. It's not enough. Uh, it should be a lot more. Uh, of course, we commend those that are. Nobody's against that. Um, any help that the plight of the Palestinian people mm -hmm. get as much appreciated, but it's still very small, you know, in comparison to what it should be. <clears throat> Which, for me, Gaza is like real life practice for the Israeli government, because all they do is attack them, air, ground, naval, and, you know, every just everything they have nothing to fight back with. But um, mm -hmm. when the Israelis were actually getting on the lawn chairs and sitting on the hills across watching every time they bombed Gaza and cheering it on. So much so that there was a reporter, I forgot for which station she was working for in the U.S., they actually threatened her life and told her that if she messed up or said anything that they know how, that she's going to be taken care of. So that's just how, what type of people that you're dealing with. And not to say that all people who live in Israel are like that, but basically the majority. I mean, they can just walk into a Palestinian home and take it. I mean, who does that? It's like, the, and they refer to it as squatter's rights. Squatter's rights, it can't be squatter's rights if it's owned by a family 
for generations and then you claim it just as if they go and they purposely sabotage um, Palestinian crops you know the, the olive trees and the grapes and the vineyards they purposely will go and burn them or sabotage them or poison the water and poison the wells I mean it just goes on and on and on they, they found that they were putting cyanide in orange juice that was being sold to Palestinians or feel this looks of hate that comes from these soldiers when they arrested me the last time. They are sending six, six special forces and as a soldier, special forces, they attack me in the demonstration. They was beating me on my body. They broke me two ribs in my chest. But that's not the only Palestinian. Two other short points. Um, nobody thinks about the 300 nuclear weapons that Jimmy Carter said that the Israelis have. So the Israelis have a nuclear umbrella over the Middle East. And they're, so all the people in that region know that if they go beyond a certain point, a nuclear bomb can come down. The Egyptians could have the gas one dam bombed. You could have a small nuclear bomb target a small country. So that's a big factor. In the last This time, there is no support from uh, Muslims or Arab countries for the Palestinians because of uh, uh, the situation in their countries. That's uh, fighting, or there is a, bit, a lot of problems in their countries. Some of these uh, uh, Muslim countries, and some of the other countries is controlled by the United States or by uh, they have relationship, good relationship with the Israelis occupation. So it's. So really, we can say that the Palestinian fighting alone. There is no more Arab country that care for the Palestinians. Uh, no more. Uh, so we, we believe in the people from the ground. That's fighting with us, standing with us. And it's a grow in Europe, in the United States. Uh, we have an Arab country also, a lot of people who support. Uh, the Palestinians and the Palestinian story, but you know it's it's not in our hands. That's to have the Arab countries with this situation there. Saudi Arabia, for example, it's they have a, a good relationship with the United States. They support them also. They give him uh, money, a good role, everything. If you go to Egypt now, where is the Palestinian borders? If we want to talk just about the Palestinian border. We have enough problems in the uh, 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 Arab countries now to deal with. Divide and conquer? Yes, and they didn't care for uh, the Palestinians. As uh, if we mentioned the last uh, massacre in Gaza, we didn't have to call it a war. Because it's not a war. It's not, yeah, it's not a war. The last uh, massacre in Gaza, when they killed 2,300 Palestinians in one month, we didn't saw uh, like uh, mass demonstrations in Arab countries, especially in Egypt. We didn't saw a lot of demonstrations. It was a few people in the streets that was supporting Palestine. That's where U.S. imperialism plays a strong fight in the Middle East and the Arab and Muslim countries and I just want to reiterate what they said. The current Muslim countries and Arab countries are far by and large, you know, minus Iran and Syria, are proxies of the United States, okay? And they are part of the problem. Saudi Arabia? Like, absolutely. Saudi Arabia is, is gone, you know, as far as... It, it, you have to understand that the Palestinian people and the Arabs in large, they, they probably hate, and I'm going to say this up front, hate the government of Saudi Arabia more than anybody else, because we understand that they only pay lip service. Okay, they create sectarianism. They create this uh, what we call fitna, which is uh, basically a ruse of you know. Uh, they put this enemy that's supposedly Shiite, okay, and they put that they stick it in the middle. That that's Saudi Arabia's role. The United Arab Emirates is the same thing. These people go out and bomb their own Muslim countries like Yemen, okay. Make no mistake that this is pushed by the United States. So what Saudi Arabia, 
what the United Arab Emirates, Jordan included, you know, um, which is probably the uh, second homeland, you know, to my family, unfortunately, they're all against the plight of the Palestinian people. And that's a reality that's on the ground. That's something that a lot of people don't like to talk about out of fear, uh, because we have Palestinians that live in Jordan. We have, um, obviously, in Syria, where Palestinians have been caught up again, you know, in the conflict there. And they're constantly trying to be pushed on one side or the other. You know, are you pro or anti-regime? And they, and no matter what side you take, you're, you're damned. Okay, so the Muslim governments play a huge role in the oppression of the Palestinian people. So let's make that clear. You know, that is something that is true, and that is something that the Zionists, you know, proudly for them that they want to say, oh, well, what about your government? You know, and regardless of that, they use it to their benefit. But the truth of the matter is, yes. You know, um, unfortunately, the Muslim governments play a huge role in the oppression of the Palestinian people. They're disregarded. They talk about, you know, we want to pray in Jerusalem, and that's all they care about. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, the Palestinian people are suffering. And the only one that's really standing with the Palestinian resistance, you know, as far as the Muslim countries, is Iran. Okay, let's be frank. They May I just story. speak to that? Uh, the United mm -hmm. States gives $2 billion in weaponry to Egypt annually, $3 billion to Israel annually, and $1 billion to the military of Jordan annually. Yes. So that is all to keep Palestine under control. Yes. Because Egypt controls the border with Gaza. Jordan controls one of the borders with the West Bank. Israel controls the other border. We should not be giving any money to a country that uses weapons on its own people, such as or Oran and any civilian such as in Egypt, why are we giving two billion in weaponry to a country that is, uh, you know, won't even allow a protest in their own country? And, you know, and they've used these weapons on civilians. I've been to Egypt, I've sat at the Rafah border, which Egypt borders with Gaza. I've seen Palestinians turned away from that border and sent back. They couldn't get into Gaza. People that were there to visit their grandma, people trying to get out to go to the hospital, students that just finished uh, uh, degrees in Cairo University, couldn't get back home to Gaza. So Egypt controls that border and has hundreds of humanitarian violations. I mean, if you just look at the revolution, uh, of course, now Israel uses the weaponry on civilians continually, and, and our tax dollars help support that, that, uh, that occupation and the siege of Gaza, which is a humanitarian crisis uh, where Israel bombed water facilities, bombed police stations, uh, civilians during the 2000, 2000, 2008, 2009 massacre, and um, it's it's unfathomable how the U.S. could be supporting dictatorships and civilian casualties to this score. It's just and, unfathomable. And the, the, we called it Israeli blooded diamonds. That they bring the diamonds from Africa and they, yes. They sell it in the United States, in, uh, in Europe, 40 percent from this money, it goes to the Israeli army. We talk about more than one billion dollar a year. So it's not just the money that comes from the government. All the money that goes to, and we have many companies in the United States that support the occupation, the, especially the army. If you have a question on that. The Zionists always using a lot of violence against the Palestinians, uh, killing people because they want them, they want to push them always to use a violence in front of the media. Uh, in Bel'ain, for example, we succeed in many ways. If you look to uh, Palestinian West Bank now, we have about 15 to 20 places that's doing the same of Bel'ain as a weekly demonstration. With international people and Israeli activists join this demonstration. Like Nalin, Nabi Saleh, Al Walaja, Al Masara, all these villages that's join the weekly demonstration and they're doing a weekly demonstration in their villages by the non-violent way. And it was a succeed to spread the, uh, this. But also, when you talk about 40 people, 40 Palestinians being killed in these non-violent demonstrations, it's also very hard to keep uh, all the people, to push all the people to participate in like this uh, method. So I think mostly we have we need more people from outside to put more pressure in the governments to stop this violence against the Palestinian people on the ground. 
because he told me when he arrested me once from the home, he told me if you didn't stop the demonstration, I will kill you. I will kill 30, 40 people from your village. I will follow your family. So this was by phones when they arrested us. Also, they were saying this to scare us. The last week we had a problem with Black Lives Matter and the demonstration, and uh, it's the same, you know, it's the same resistance. And we are with all the people in the world who, who is, have a resistance to have the justice. And we have, uh, we, we didn't have any problem to work with them to be in the same way because there is no justice in Palestine, no justice here in the United States. So we can work together and they are uh, fighting for their right to live like a human being. They want their justice, so we are with them. We learn a lot from uh, other cases of non-violent resistance like uh, in India, Gandhi, uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, all these cases that comes uh, in our minds that teach us a lot of uh, non-violent resistance. Also, as a Palestinian people, we are not a violent people. Supporting Palestinian rights does support black rights here in America. It's all connected. Okay, it's all interconnected. As um, my colleague here was explaining before, uh, Ahlam. Um, in reference to the police state here, where black people are affected and are being killed, um, are the same methods that are being used by Israeli police, by the Israeli occupation against the Palestinians. So when America here sends police forces, when they send their leaders, when they send their um, chiefs of police to train by the Israeli government, okay, they use brutal tactics, right, and they bring them back here to America, and by and large kill blacks, Latinos, um, and all oppressed people, it is connected. So when we're fighting that, we're fighting against that. We're fighting against police oppression against black people, police oppression against Palestinians. It's all interconnected. Um, when Ferguson happened, the, the people in Palestine, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, were actually tweeting people in Ferguson on how to resist the police violence there on how to resist in the demonstrations. You know, they, they're actually telling them what to do if you get sprayed by mace. Um, uh, I guess using all forms of stuff that they use in Palestine uh, to help relieve the pain by being sprayed by OC and, and so on and so forth, and how to resist nonviolently. Okay, so these were tactics that were brought on by the Palestinians directly by social media. And this is the phenomenon of social media and how quickly people are connected. So yes, it is connected. Um, if we fight, for Palestinian rights, we are actually fighting for rights here because APAC is a lobby that is uh, basically supporting the oppression, the illegal occupation of Palestine. So we need to fight them because instead of our money going outside, and we don't want our money to go anywhere. We don't want it to go to the Palestinian Authority. We don't want our money to go to the Egyptians that are also part of the siege on Gaza. Let's make, let's make it clear. The Egyptians are also responsible for the siege on Gaza, not just Israel. It is in Egyptian Israeli siege on Gaza. Okay, and that needs to always be said and need to be corrected. So, yes, so this all stops that by fighting for Palestinian rights, by fighting to end the illegal occupation of Palestine, we are also fighting for America because APAC is hijacking American foreign policy and we need to stop that. And once we stop that, um, you will have the cities in Flint not have their water poisoned. You will have the streets in Cleveland, the police officers even who are being laid off, the safety officers in Cleveland, okay, won't be laid off, all right? And a lot of things in America would go straight if we only ended the occupation in Palestine. So yes, it is all connected. It is all fighting, not just the occupation in Palestine, but fighting against US imperialism all over the world. And we are responsible for it here. We are Americans. This is our tax dollars. So I'm speaking as a person of Palestinian descent, who's here by force, by the way. I wasn't, you know, I didn't ask to be in America. So for those Islamophobes that want me to go back to Palestine, I welcome you to join our movement. 
to call for the return of the Palestinian refugees <laughs> to get the hell out of America and go get back to Palestine. Here. Yeah. Go so home. stand with me, and I want that fight. Being held accountable at Kent State until we get on top of our own past injustice that have, that are still wounds wide open people don't even see anymore. I don't. It, it's all connected. Yes. But as Americans, we can't get American people to pay attention to the injustice in our own front yard, backyard, up the street. How do we get to the heart of it all? And, and just, that, that's that been my ongoing question. It, it's, you know, I can stand in solidarity with people. I can't get out of the country right now, but I, I've i wanted to go many times. I was going to go with Mazen. I was going to, you know, and that never happened, um, unfortunately, or I would be there. But I don't understand until we get to the heart of the injustice and the, the hypocrisy of this country that we were built on. You know, we killed we killed all of my people, and we built on the backs of this gentleman's people, and we allow a small group of people to to in the last 20 years completely hijack our country. It, it, our our laws don't work. They steal elections. The will of the people isn't in place. I mean, obviously this election proves that. Um, how do we resolve ourselves to be human and get out of our box of the past that confines all of us with hatred? And I would love New York State back for my people. Truly, I would. But I can't. I don't see that happening. And I would love to be able to give Palestine back to those people who are still have their keys in their pockets because they want me, okay? I, I just, as an, as an activist, I will stand on a line, I will put my body down, but I don't even, there, there's no justice in the courts. There's, it, it's a very large thing we all have to resolve internally as humans to get rid of this hatred that is keeping us all blind to each other's very real predicaments. I mean, your people live in an open air prison camp. There is no doubt. My people here in Cleveland are gunned down in the street with no resolution and we have police that think it's okay that we have no problem when someone 137 shots into a car or a child in 1.6 seconds is dropped without a weapon in his hand. And the people of this area are okay with that. It, it goes beyond borders, ethnicities, it, it, it's a power grab that has been going on for decades, if not millennia, of all of human history. There's always got to be an other to keep the ruling class in place. How do we stop that? Correlate Palestinians to Islam, um, and they don't realize that's the birthplace of Jesus. Right. So I think once you have people don't know what Palestine is, and when people ask me where am I from, and I say Palestine, oh, Pakistan? No, it's not Pakistan. It's, Pal it's, it's Palestine, and they don't know where it's at. So I think it's just having more people out there, um, educating people. It's because we have to understand, they're only being taught with the media is letting them know. Um, so whether it's the news stations, movies, entertainment, and even um, in school. I mean, all they learn about is the you know, what happened in Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, and then how the, the Jews fleed, fled and went to Israel. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they never learned that there were people living there first. Right. And that it would, I mean, same thing as the misinformation mis, um, with American Indians. You know, it's the same thing. So I think once people go out more and do more activism and educate people more about what's going on, then there'll be, it's more about the humanistic side. I think the lack of, hum Humanism and empathy is the issue, whether, regardless of whether it's Palestine, Burma, um, what's going on in Somalia or Sudan, or even in the United States. I mean, we have ghettos in, over, in, even in the east side, in East Cleveland, where people are being killed all the time. And the thing is, nobody cares because they don't feel it relates to them. And, and, and make, having them understand how it relates to them, teaching them how everything is interrelated, will better help them. Once they learn it's about more than just Muslims, it's not a Muslim thing or it's not just a Palestinian thing, um, and they realize that they, we, need, we need to tell them how, what they're doing to children, how they're arresting children, how they're killing women during labor, trying to get to the hospital, um, people, you know, it, the, people will start acting on People will start making more. I mean, when I explain this to people, then they start saying, okay, well, I'm not going to get from Starbucks, or I'm not going to get from Menchies. Did you know Menchies was owned by an Israeli soldier? 
property that most people didn't know that. I mean, Manchese was, is owned and started by an Israeli soldier who referred to Palestinians as terrorists. So we don't eat from Manchese. So I think, and if I think that's where it starts, and that's where people need need to begin is teaching humanism and empathy at a young age, and then explaining what exactly is going on and how it's affecting people. Against their own governments, well, as are sure some that. of the people. <laughs> the government is suppressing its own people in Egypt. They killed the democracy movement in those countries. So it's the government against the people rather than the country. There's a division in these countries, and that's exactly what's going on in Palestine. The Palestinian people do not love the Palestinian authority which is really collaborating with the United States and with Israel to maintain order for the advantage of the people in Ramallah who have advantages of living in that place to the disadvantage of all the, the, the majority of the people. And we know that formula here. Very conservative communities, white, black, the, the white liberals scared all the black uh, folks out because it was just some things people say. I, I, I can tell you what. It's hey. just I, I, some some white people they mean well, but I'll tell you their language is really patronizing and <laughs> just not working for people. Tell us what you're saying. But but for 20, I mean for a year we sat every week with a mediator doing our due diligence on this one, and as soon as we were supposed to do it, nobody would. Violent resistance is the way that show the face of the violent. There is no freedom, no justice, so you have to fight and the, the resistance is the first step to freedom. You didn't have any choice just to be in resistance. Of course I have uh, hope to end the occupation next week because this we are doing our demonstrations every week. We didn't go to the demonstration because we like it, we are going to end the occupation and we have hope to end the occupation next week. I cannot put myself in hope to end the occupation after five years because I cannot put myself more five years under the occupation in my future time. So this gives me hope to continue the, uh, end the occupation next week.